let's wait a bit uh, two more minutes <clears throat> All right, let's begin. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, good evening, everybody. I am Divyansh, and I welcome you all to the second talk in the Growing Up in Science series. The first talk was delivered by Professor Jayant Udgaonkar and is available on our YouTube channel and the website. So the essence of this series is that careers in academia aren't laid with one accomplishment after another, as any established faculty member's CV might make you believe, but rather that struggles and failures are an integral part of it. Um, during the talk, feel free to ask your questions in the chat box. They'll be taken up during the Q&A session that will be held afterwards. Um, those who are watching the YouTube live stream can also ask questions through the live comments. Our speaker today is our Dean of Academics, Professor Bas Bapat. His work is primarily in the physics of atomic collisions, molecular fragmentation, and instrumentation of ion spectrometers and such. He did his BSc in physics. I'll give a brief introduction of the uh, various academic checkpoints and which we'll, he'll go in detail about. He did his BSc in physics from Pune University in 1990. He went on to do his PhD at TIFR after a master's in physics from an IIT. After a postdoc in Germany, he became a visiting scientist at the Center for Advanced Technology at Indore, after which, in 2001, he became a faculty member at the Phys Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad. He joined ISA Pune in 2014, and he has been here ever since. Um, you can now begin, Professor. Okay. Uh, thanks, Divyansh. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, when Divyansh called me or wrote to me some three weeks ago, asking me whether I would like to talk on this platform, um, I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but then I thought it might actually be a good idea uh, mm -hmm. because it will probably give me a chance to reflect on what I've done in all these years. And, uh, you know, benefit of hindsight is actually a very wonderful thing. It uh, lets you see things differently from what they seem when they happen. And it also gives you a chance to reflect uh, and correct your course. If you, know, if you realize that you have made some mistake, you did something incorrectly, or you could have done something in a different fashion, uh, here is a chance for you to think about it and change things uh, when they happen next. And uh, so that for that reason, I'm uh, thankful to Kalpa for offering me this platform. Uh, when I started thinking about what to say, uh, I was, uh, you know, I, I like to think about what I would like to call this talk. So I thought maybe me and Kalpa. And then, you know, suddenly this Latin term rhymed, with, rhymed in my head, Mia Kalpa, which means that I'm in the wrong. So maybe I'm in the wrong in doing this. And Kalpa is offering me a platform for the same. So that, is, that, uh, that aside, uh, I think it's a good good opportunity, and I'll really like to share uh, what I have done in all these years. Uh, Divyansh and the email that came to me from Kalpa said that uh, I, I should speak about my struggles in life, in my academic and my academic career, uh, so that uh, students get inspired uh, from what I say. Uh, now, inspire is a very lofty word, uh, just as struggle is a very harsh one. And I frankly don't think that my life or my career spans either of these extremes. Okay, I mean, let me be very honest about that. But I think there are some pointers to both. And that is really what I am going to talk about. And this is not just a case of you know, false humility. Sometimes people think that, oh, this person is being too humble or whatever. Uh, but I don't think that's the case. It's just a case of calling a spade a spade. And being able to call a spade a spade is really an important thing to remember in one's life. 
for instance i mean if you are born in a in a family that is well off and so on well that's something you are born with you have no contribution in that and there's no no denying the advantage of being born in a caring family or in a family that does not have to struggle to lead a decent life uh, on top of that if the family recognizes the value and importance of education all the better for you and this is really nothing that something that you have no role in you are either born into it or you're not so i was fortunate enough to be born in a family that was uh, comfortably off if not very well off uh, and uh, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, good values good education in not just my uh, my immediate family but also in my extended family and that certainly uh, had an important role to play uh, in shaping my life uh my father used to work for the forest department and as a forest officer he you know his his uh, post kept getting transferred so before i appeared for my board exam that is before i finished my class 10 uh, i had already visited five different schools and uh, these five different schools uh, were as short as eight or nine months and the longest one was about four years but these four years also were not you know very smooth four years uh, these four years were from two different locations so i used to commute uh, commute from one town to the other so because of these uh, changes i mean changes many changes in uh, home uh, shifting from one town to another shifting from one school to another uh, this uh, sort of made it imperative that i learn to adjust to changes uh, very quickly very rapidly without losing time or glossing over what how it could have been different and so on and uh, this i am told is very important in life now at that point it didn't seem like that it seemed like the natural thing to do it seemed like the obvious thing to do it seemed like there was really no option no alternative and uh, this uh, i think this came easily to all of us my parents my brother and me and it doesn't seem to me to be uh, that that we did something very unusual uh but uh, you know when i talk to parents today and when i talk to counselors today they they seem to think that this is very important but i i really you know can't can't say too much uh, about it now the downside of having gone to so many schools uh, was that i uh, didn't really develop any great attachment to a particular school or to a particular town or even to teachers okay so this was something that i that i maybe i missed out missed out on in my life uh, because many of my friends have uh, spent their entire 10 years in one school and they have great memories of friends great memories of events and so on and this was quite evident in one of the school re- re- reunions that i attended in recent years uh, there were a whole bunch of people 40 50 60 of them and uh, i was kind of an outsider i really didn't uh, you know feel quite at home there felt a bit lost now uh, that's that's how school had been for me uh, and really i mean i although i have some nice memories uh, it it's not something that i very and this really very little that i very fondly remember uh, the hard part in school was really those four years when i had to commute so i we lived in one town uh, i had to go to school uh, well town meaning it was more like a village uh and uh, i had to go to the district place for school so this was like a one hour commute each way every day so uh, leave home on a bicycle leave your bicycle at the bus station take a bus get off at the bus station at the other end walk to school from there and repeat the process in reverse day uh, every day except sundays in our days uh, saturdays were school days that is were saturdays were not not off it was a six week it's a six day week so barring sundays i was doing this pretty much every day for 3 years not for 3 years and uh, that must have been hard but you know i mean on recollection i don't remember any particular event where where we struggled but of course there were some some quite quite uh, what shall i say anxious moments once in a while when uh, one day my i didn't go to school and my brother did alone and he didn't turn uh, come back home on time and then you know i suddenly it suddenly occurred to me oh that uh, this he is younger to me and uh, i suddenly thought oh maybe he fell asleep when the bus went past our place okay and and those were days when there were no telephones no way to contact anybody at all 
so we had a fairly anxious uh, evening until late in the night uh, there must have been a few incidences like that which uh, were hardships but they were not things that actually made or uh, made, made or broke your life okay. uh, and uh, it probably was also hard on my parents i mean i i don't think i ever talked to them about this uh, but it must have been hard on them uh, having to go through the anxiety of their boys especially my mother uh, going to school every day to a fairly distant place in uh, with poor communication uh, but uh, we sailed through and i think we came out all the better out of that experience uh, i must say that my parents were uh, never very fussy uh, and uh, while they were they were caring uh, they they never pampered to any of our whims and i don't think we had any either so it was quite smooth sailing and uh, they were watchful of what we were doing but uh, i don't think they i mean i don't recall any instance where they were actually overseeing our homework or overseeing what we were studying or what we were reading but they generally kept a distant watch and for this i am really grateful to them because this meant that we had the freedom to pursue what we wanted and uh, that really stood us in good stead uh, through the rest of our lives uh, so you know when it came to career choices which i'll talk talk about in a in a little while uh, nothing was uh, really forced upon us we had the freedom of choosing what we wanted to do and uh, as i said earlier uh, school wasn't something that i can i have great uh, fond memories of but there were a few few nice things uh, on the whole it was it was a somewhat dull experience there were some nice bits uh, but it was fairly and most of the times it was fairly routine if not rote uh, a couple of incidents that i remember is you know in one school uh, we used to have these two work experience classes two classes one two two periods one after the other which was about an hour and hour and 10 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes or thereabouts and uh, these two periods uh, were uh, sort of reserved for this work experience kind of uh, activities now the girls were sent off to a home science class somewhere nearby and we boys had nothing to do okay we were not supposed to go to the home science class and the girls were not supposed to be with us uh, so we had all the free time and every saturday for these two hours followed by another hindi class which you know our hindi teacher was unaware of the fact that we boys had nothing to do and only the girls had something to do all this meant that for every saturday for several months together all we used to go do is go to school and play football for two hours which was you know a lot of fun but then uh, that ended abruptly one day and that was the end of our football and that was the end of our happy times uh, but there have been incidences very very funny incidences like that i also remember that in in one school i was uh, i was punished and uh, punished for reasons that i really do not know i mean i i still do not know this i and a friend of mine uh, we were asked to sit outside the class for a week for a whole week okay and uh, we were given no explanation of uh, why we were uh, being meted out that punishment and every day we used to ask our class teacher you know, can we come and sit inside the class and she used to say no so after a few days we stopped asking and one fine day she said okay tomorrow tomorrow onwards you can sit in the class and no explain i mean we tried asking her you know why just us and what reason and so on and uh, we got no answer but we left it at that we didn't make any sure of it but that that's one memory that i have from from my class 7 i think or maybe 8 okay. so that that's how uh, you know, school was it was a mixed bag it was not uh, something that i found it in a book now uh, by the time we came to class 10 uh, i was doing reasonably well and uh, i mean it was it was fairly smooth sailing but for a while in in between it seemed i had gone off track uh, i was doing particularly badly in maths so uh, two of my uncles and an aunt who are all who are all teachers uh, they stepped in and made sure that uh, that i got back on track and i am really grateful for them uh, grateful to them for that and in very recently only about you know 3 or 4 weeks ago uh, the same aunt of mine who i was talking to said you know i i ju i just cannot imagine you in this position of the dean of icer pune somebody who couldn't do very simple math sums in your class 
description. Now, I, I don't exactly remember where I was doing badly, but I do remember that I was doing badly in maths in class 10, and she was responsible for uh, putting me back on track. So uh, there were some ups and downs, but uh, nothing that I would call uh, you know, particularly harsh or particularly uh, low. Okay. After I finished my class 10, uh, I uh, went to college. Uh, I mean, the whole, the, you know, the main thing was to get into a good college. It wasn't very clear what I wanted to do two years down the line, five years down the line. Uh, there, was, there was a fair deal of uncertainty. Uh, but I, sir, I knew that it was important to get into a good college, and I went to Ferguson College after that. Uh, in those days, we used to do 11th and 12th in what was called the junior college uh, as part of uh, Ferguson College. So after I went to Ferguson College, uh, we started uh, learning the usual physics, chemistry, maths, uh, geography, things like that. And uh, again, you know, maths seemed particularly hard to me. And uh, then I discovered that this was not just me who was finding it hard, everybody was finding it hard. And slowly, meaning when I say slowly, I mean really after several years, uh, I figured out that that is really a ploy that the, that the board uh, employs. Keep the class 10 level of mathematics low and keep the class 11 level high so that not many people fail in class 10. Okay. So the jump from class 10 to 11th was really enormous. And uh, I, I very clearly remember that although we had a good teacher, uh, I had a tough time, and many of us had a tough time managing. And then began the dilemmas. The dilemmas began because, you know, on the one hand, it seemed like, you know, some of the subjects that I was uh, learning were not very interesting or I was not very good at, or at least I hadn't, hadn't found the right uh, tuning with the subject. Okay. So, uh, I don't, I don't know what are, what, what different options I was considering them, but one that I really pursued was, uh, uh, you know, I was starting with the idea of uh, getting into the armed forces. Now I was, uh, we were in Pune then, and uh, Pune, as you know, is a big uh, hub for all uh, army and air force activities. And the National Defense Academy is right next door. So all this was very fascinating. I mean, for, for somebody at the age of 16 or so, that can be quite fascinating. And uh, I talked to my parents about this and they were quite quite enthusiastic about me joining the armed forces. Um, so all the hardships, all the discipline, uh, the various things that people in the army and the force were supposed to be doing uh, and the honor, all of that was very attractive. Uh, but then, you know, it, it was, I was told that this was not a very easy uh, exam to to pass and <clears throat> the interviews were very difficult and so on. But I, I went ahead and gave it a try. And uh, I gave it a shot, wrote the written exam, passed it in the first attempt, then went over to the services selection board. Uh, I managed to impress them and I, I cleared the services selection board interview in the first attempt. Um, so it would have been a very different story had uh, this story continued, but it, that was really the end of the story because my, my myopia uh, stood in the way of a career in the armed forces. Okay. And had, had I not had uh, myopia, I would have become a gentleman cadet at the ripe young age of 16 and a half. And life would have been very, very different. But of course, I mean, now in hindsight, I can dwell upon it and wonder whether that would have been the right choice or not. Maybe it would have been. But I think it doesn't help to dwell upon such things. What is past is past. And you can't, uh, uh, you know, continuously think and um, continue to think about what how things might have been had X happened or X not happened. But that was one career choice that uh, I had to let go. So then I turned my attention to uh, doing my regular class 12, my class 12 exams. And I did badly there. Uh, I mean, badly meaning not terribly badly, but badly enough. Uh, my, my, my sights were really set on doing mechanical engineering. And uh, my low marks meant that I couldn't get admission to any engineering college. I was really fascinated by automobiles and aeroplanes. And most of all, I was fascinated by railways. And uh, I'll admit that I'm, even today, I uh, am really truly fascinated by railways. I mean, I, I, I still keep track of railway developments and you know things that are happening in the railway world uh, even, even today. Okay. That fascination still continues. 
and then a, a family friend of a friend of a very close friend of my father uh, he told us about uh, this railway engineering college at uh, jamalpur in, in west bengal and he 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 inquired about it and he said that look the, this college uh, takes students after class 12 for a degree in railway engineering so you know it was like uh, like a jackpot for me uh, with my fascination for railways and my inclination towards mechanical engineering it seemed the right thing to do and so i appeared for another ups upsc exam the railway board conducts this uh, via the upsc i appeared for this exam and uh, i passed it uh, but uh, something else happened what happened is that this exam happened sometime in july and by the time the results came out it was close to diwali and uh, my brother and i had gone on a cycle trip at that time followed by a fairly big family get together for diwali uh, and we were away from home for uh, i think uh, something like 10 days or 2 weeks so the telegram that uh, had uh, had called me or invited me to attend an interview uh, with the railway board it lay unattended under the door uh, when we came back Uh, the date of the interview was over so bad luck there were no telephones there were no I mean, there was no internet of course and there was not even a decent telephone connection then to find out if you know there was still an opportunity or not um, so that was really the end of uh, this second uh, calling and this is something i i think could have been a good career choice for me i really don't know again uh, there's no point in reflecting on what could have been uh, you just move on but by then i think college was getting exciting uh this was 1988 and uh, i i was uh, i really started enjoying college uh i would like to share a couple of anecdotes from college which uh, i mean college, college anecdotes related to academics uh, which i think uh, show a very different i mean show college in a very different light uh i was fortunate to, uh, to have been part of this I I had studied geology for a year uh, in my first year and uh, one of our teachers uh, Dr Desh Pandey he said look I mean this is fine we are doing a geology course and there is a certain textbook prescribed and I'll be I'll be teaching you this but it is also important that you learn to talk about what you understood you learn to say what you like about the subject or what fascinates you or something that you might have read and you have queries about so let us do this once a week two of you will come and stand here and speak for 5 minutes about any topic in geology that has uh, caught your attention so my turn was not the first but in the second week it was my turn and you I mean, you wouldn't believe this i had such stage fright i just couldn't utter those five sentences that i had prepared and i just you know just gave up and came back and sat on my bench so dr deshpande then called me he said look i mean you why why is why why were you so frightened i mean there's no reason for you to have stage fright you know what you're talking about all of these people sitting here are your friends i'm not going to pounce upon you if you don't do this so there's no reason come on you you know why don't you do it now so i spoke in front of him whatever i had prepared and that came out much better that was my first experience talking to an audience and uh, it was a it was a frightening one but uh, you know because of my teacher it was i mean it was it was really a turning point and i have my uh, i had my lesson learned and i must i must thank dr deshpande for that the second one was that we had an excellent maths department ferguson college had uh, had an excellent maths, maths department and uh, we really used to enjoy our maths classes and one of our teachers once he was just walking past the corridor and uh, he uh, ours was a very small class by the way the the you know combination of subjects that i had taken was not taken by many people so we were a very small section in the second year and uh, he uh, said you know why why are you people sitting here idly he said oh, we said oh, our teacher is on leave today and we didn't know what to uh, we 
we don't have much to do. So he said, okay, why don't you come along? So then he assembled something like, you know, three sections together in one class, all, I mean, really jam packed. So Ferguson College Maths Department had two very large lecture halls, quite like R103 or so, uh, but more densely packed. And uh, we were, we must have been about 250 students assembled impromptu. Uh, and Professor Prakash then just, you know, took off. He talked to us about probability, he talked to us about combinatorics, he talked to us about geometry, about the tiling problem, about a variety of things. And he started showing us links between combinatorics, crystallography, uh, geometric, some, some geometric, uh, you know, some theorems in geometry and so on. All of it impromptu. For one and a half hours, we were mesmerized. And, and that was one, one event that really told me the importance of, you know, studying well, learning well in order to be able to teach. You cannot do this if you're shallow. You cannot do this if you don't, if you haven't spent enough time thinking about your subject. And that's something that, uh, that was another lesson learned in, in those years. Uh, there are many more, but I think I'll, I'll stop here for want of time. So college was nice. And uh, there were two other things which, uh, which really uh, had a deep impact on me in those formative years. The first was uh, that in those days, I mean, in Pune in those days, a membership to the British Library was something very sought, very much sought. It, it almost had a cult status. So I promptly, I mean, as soon as I got my college I card, I went to the British Library and said, I want to become a member. You couldn't become a member unless you were either about certain age or had a college I card, something like that. So I, I went and I became a member and uh, that was a whole new world. I mean, there were so many things to read, so many very, very good books to read, uh, magazines, I mean, if you name it and it was there. And this was 1987, 1988, and this was essentially only print media, there was nothing else. But there was so much to read there, so much to learn. Uh, everything from sport to photography to architecture to geology to philosophy to literature whatnot. The other membership which I um, which I very fondly remember and I'm almost proud of is the membership of, of a mountaineering club called Giri Brahman here in Pune. Um, I mean, hill walking and mountaineering was was a big big thing then as it is now uh, in these in these areas. And uh, here was a club which was uh, which was quite different from the rest. I mean, it was it was run by a maverick. Uh, Dr. Patwardhan, who was an ex-army doctor, who had lost his uh, hearing in uh, in, a, in a war, right? I think the 62 China war, or maybe the 65 war. Uh, he lost his hearing and he was, uh, he had to leave the army. And he was, he was a bachelor and he was fond of the hills. He formed this club and uh, it was, it, it was, it was superb three years. I mean, I, I really recall those three years with, with great, 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 uh, happiness. We learned a lot of things. What we learned, of course, we learned, uh, you know, it, it really opened the door to wilderness. It opened the, opened the door to learning how to live with hardship. It taught me people skills. It taught me the value of minimalist ideas, of frugality, of improvisation. And of course, uh, it led to a vastly improved level of physical fitness, endurance, mental balance and mental alertness. And both these things, I mean, my college, my mountaineering club, all of these contributed in a big way to my pool of friends who had very differing backgrounds, who had very differing goals and who had very diverging views. But each one of them, I think, influenced me, me in some way, good or bad. But all of that I uh, still cherish I have fond memories and I think they influence me, me in more ways than one. So by, by that time, I think I was, I was then uh, more or less uh, sort of hooked to the idea that I would, I would go and do physics. And uh, this was contributed in no small way by two uh, very good teachers in my college, uh, Dr. Kedkar and Dr. Kuntan Dekar. And uh, my attraction for physics grew from that point on. And the turning point perhaps was uh, a competition organized by the Pune University. They had organized a competition for undergraduate students to write an essay on any topic in physics. And this was handwritten essays, okay? 10 pages of handwritten essays. 
Um, I think I wrote about quantum mechanics, if I remember it right. Uh, so there was an essay, and then there was also a, a lecture competition. So you have to speak for five minutes. Okay. So my stage fright of five minutes from my geo geology class had vanished. And by the time I came to the third year, I took part in this competition and actually won it. So that was a sea change in three years. And I think that was really the turning point, uh, which led me uh, into the vistas of physics. Uh, so third year of BSc was a lot of hard work, self-driven hard work, I must, I must say, a lot of self-driven hard work. And finally, I, after finishing my BSc, I went to IIT Bombay. Now, IIT Bombay, again, was a very different, uh, different scenario altogether. Uh, teachers were uh, better by and large. Some of them were truly exceptional. And, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing was that exams were not predictable. Exams were not predictable. And this uncertainty uh, made things more challenging because it forced you to think deep as well as think wide. I mean, you had to do both things. You had to, you couldn't just, you know, read a few things and get, uh, get away with it. So you learned to, learn to study in a very different manner. Of course, there were a lot of other extracurricular things. And uh, these extracurricular things at the age of 20 can be quite distracting. Uh, but uh, fortunately, I stayed my course and uh, did uh, reasonably well. Uh, my, my project guide, uh, Professor Sharad Chandra Patil, who was an absolutely brilliant teacher. You know? uh, I, I think I'll... Um, Divyansh, am I, am I exceeding my time? Uh, no, no. Uh, is, is this okay? I mean, this is okay. very interesting. Okay. So, Professor Patil is somebody I, I really respect and admire. Uh, he taught us just one course uh, in those two years. But that course, uh, of course, we were a small class, so that did make a difference. Had we been a big class, it would have been, uh, it may not have turned out this way. And in this class, what he said is uh, almost on the very first day, he said, look, or maybe two weeks down the line, he said, look, I mean, I assume, and uh, I don't think I'm wrong in this. I assume that you are here to do your master's because you're interested in the subject and not because you merely want to pass an exam. Okay. And the course will be based on this assumption, on the assumption that you want to learn the subject and not pass the exam. So we will, we will not you know, go by the road. We will invest time. We'll all invest time. I mean, he always, it was always we, he never said you. We'll invest time in this. And, uh, but I expect your dedication. I expect you to stay focused. So every, every week once we had this tutorial session when you used to say, look, I mean, you go and have your tea or biscuits or whatever. You should be here by 4.30 and we'll sit here till dinner if, ne if needed, but we'll sit and do these problems. And he never really solved the entire problem for us. Never, not even once, but he used to be always there to see how we were solving the problems. And uh, if we asked him any doubts, he would help us. But he never solved the problem on the board. But that training uh, you know, went a very long way. The best part was his exams. He said, I mean, the, he said, look, I don't believe in too many exams. Uh, the mid-semester exam and the end-semester exam are mandated by the institute, so we'll have them. But I'll not have any assignments, any graded assignments, or uh, any other exams or quizzes or anything like that. I, I, he, he didn't believe in those. So the mid -sem exam day came. Uh, the exam was to start at 2 o'clock. We were all there. So he came in at 2 o'clock, handed us our question papers. And after 15 minutes, he says, I mean, he had told us something along these lines earlier. At 2.15, he says, look, I'm going to go to my office and do my work. You can sit here for as long as you want but try to solve all the problems. It doesn't matter how long you take because I'm not going to be here to watch how long you take. All I expect is when, you, when I come back tomorrow to my office, all your exam papers, answer sheets should be on my table. My office is open through the night. You can take however long you want. Now, you know, that was, that was an enormous responsibility on us. It was, it was a responsibility to attempt all questions with, with the best of our ability, 
no matter whether we could solve them or not. We were not pressed for time. And to be honest, we were not even pressed not to ask others. He never said that. He didn't say you could discuss, but he never said you can't discuss. And I'll, and one incident from the, not from the end sem exam, but the, uh, sorry, not the mid sem exam, but the end sem exam was that, you know, we finished, uh, I mean, at least some of us finished by about 7, 7.30, having started at two o'clock and we went to dinner. And after dinner, we were chatting about the paper and one of us suddenly said, oh, you know, I think I have uh, made one mistake in one of the answers. So he went back, uh, the question, the answer sheets were on Professor Patel's uh, table. He went back, picked up his answer sheet, corrected it and put it back. Not one of us felt that he had cheated. Now, I, I, I mean, I, I think this is, this is to the teacher's credit. Okay. That the teacher had that kind of faith in the students. The teacher had that kind of faith in the evaluation system. And uh, the goal was to learn the subject and not just to pass. Oh, I can hear see a question where he's asking whether online ensems can be in this manner. Okay, let's see. So uh, you know that that's how my that's how my master's years went, and uh, there were of course a few other good teachers also. But Professor Patil is somebody I I remember very dearly. I also worked uh, for my master's project with him, and he he was a, he was a theoretician, but he advised me to get into experimental uh, areas, experimental research because he felt that theory was stagnating and experimental research was on the rise. And uh, I took his advice. And as I had said earlier, all these years, I was really used to uh, taking my own calls. And this was really the first time I took anybody's advice in the earnest. I assiduously fo followed his advice and chose to go into experimental atomic physics research. And uh, that's not a decision I regret. Uh, I applied, uh, well, I, I appeared for the GRE, did badly there. Uh, but I also applied to TIFR and ISC for PhD positions. I got admitted in both places. The TIFR uh, call came first and I went there. And two weeks later, I also got the ISC call. Uh, TIFR was a great place to work. And as, as it happens to a lot of people, um, I didn't get my choice of supervisor to work with. So it was disappointing for a while. But I think in hindsight, it was a good thing. Because, uh, you know, the system there was that you, you tried out a few things and then you know, the guide chose you depending on your ranking and this, that, many other factors. And I ended up working with uh, Professor E. Krishna Kumar, uh, who was not only a thorough experimentalist, a very thorough scientist, but also a very thorough human being, a very honest, upright human being. And uh, for a PhD, that is important because see, you're, you're committing five years of life and five very crucial years of life. So, uh, you know, I was really lucky to have a very good guy. Now my PhD times were also ups and downs like everybody's PhD times are. And uh, you normally end up doing a lot of things that in some very vague way contribute to your thesis, but are not directly related to your thesis. Okay, so that happened to me too. But you learn a lot in the process. So what I learned is I learned how to tackle problems. I learned how to build my own instruments. I learned how to read what other people want to say, wanted to say, or understand other people's ideas. So this is all part of training. Okay. So it doesn't directly, I mean, you can't show that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between what you learned and what goes into your thesis. But in the background, there are a lot of things that you learned that, that feed into your thesis. Unfortunately, my PhD hit a roadblock in my fourth year. Uh, for a variety of reasons, one of the reasons being that, that some experiments that we were trying to or were planning to do were undoable in our setup, so we had to move things elsewhere. And then there was some infighting in the department, which meant that I and my supervisor had to wind up from the, that lab, uh, dismantle all the setups, relocate it, rebuild it, uh, and all this during my fourth year. So that meant I, I lost a fair bit of time. But of course, I was not the only one who was facing problems. There were others. Uh, some of them had very smooth sailing. Some of them had greater hardships than me. And uh, some of my mates who actually went through greater difficulties are doing very well now. 
and there are some for whom the sailing was smooth, but they have now disappeared from the horizon. So the bottom line is that it is, I think it is you who make your own life. You can't depend on others and you can't, uh, you know, sort of assume that if something is going well for you, it will continuously go well for you. It doesn't happen that way. And then at the end of the PhD, it seemed like, I mean, it was expected that all the uncertainties would somehow vanish. My parents certainly thought so. Uh, I was hoping it would be so, but I was, I also knew that that was not the case. So finding a, finding a position after that wasn't easy, but I was lucky to have, uh, uh, have an opportunity to work uh, in the group of uh, Joachim Ulrich in Germany, uh, who was a pioneer of a, of a new technique in atomic collision studies, which is uh, uh, very nicely called a reaction microscope. So I had a lot to learn. I mean, I had, a, I had this new technique to learn and he was a wonderful person. One of the things that I remember there in his group, uh, of course, I was the native English speaker, by the way. Okay, So all, uh, all manuscripts used to come to me for English language help. But then one of the papers that I wrote, uh, Joachim actually turned it completely on its head as far as the logic was concerned. So I remember that the, type, the typescript that I'd given to him for his for his uh, perusal. Uh, when it came back after two days, it was all you know, scribbled, scratched all over. And in many places, he had written logic in his German style with the K, logic, logic, logic. And I didn't uh, quite understand what he meant. So it, it turned out that, you know, uh, I, I don't know why that happened, but in, in several places, I had actually mixed up the cause-effect relationships. In, in, in my in my writing so that was that was a lesson that I learned you know don't don't assume that because your English language skills are good or better than your colleagues you'll also write things properly anyway uh, I, I learned I learned things there I learned a few other things which I had no experience of so I made forays into different uh, branches of physics while I was a postdoc and uh, I was in a place called Freiburg in Germany uh, which was which is a very beautiful place. And ideally located for pursuing two of my uh, great hobbies, uh, cycling and photography, uh, very, very nicely. When I started looking for faculty positions in, in India, uh, I was wooed by Kailash Rastogi, who was then at the Raja Ramana Center for Advanced Technology in Indore. Uh, he was visiting Germany and uh, in, in a place near where I was. And he said, why don't you come and meet me? So I went, I met him. He was staying with some friends and uh, he started talking to me about uh, you know coming to his institute for a faculty position or whatever a visiting position something like that so it seemed all quite nice and i i sort of agreed and i i was quite uh, happy to see him offer me that position because that lunch that we had together i had completely messed up i spilled something in trying to serve something that i could not serve so, you know, I was, I was wondering whether somebody so clumsy could be offered a position in an experimental laboratory. But he did offer me a position and I went there. But I didn't like it there. Uh, and I was actually given advice that uh, I shouldn't go to the place. It's not a particularly great place to work. Um, not, not for the kind of temperament that I have or I had. Uh, so I, I, say I, I perhaps lost a year in the process. And you could say that I lost a year process only if you're pessimistic. I mean, if you, if you take an optimistic view of things, there's always something to be learned, even from a place that you don't like. So I, 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 I did pick up a few nice things uh, from there. And they came in useful later when I was doing uh, a new set of experiments later at Ahmedabad. So when I came to Ahmedabad in 2001, I started my own group. We started doing experiments on molecular uh, physics. And we did some, some very nice, uh, fairly pioneering. I mean, we maybe two or three groups in the world were doing similar things at the time, uh, studying fragmentation of molecules, looking into very minute details and trying to see how molecular structures change when they're perturbed and so on. Uh, quite, quite interesting times. I had some very enthusiastic colleagues. I had, uh, my first student was, a, was Vandana, who was extremely enthusiastic and uh, very meticulous. And that, I think, set the tone for future students. Uh, I had a good crop of students, uh, not, not all equally good, but some, some of them were extremely good. And uh, several of them are now in different faculty positions in the country. So that was, that was a nice spell. Uh, 
and PRL is a laboratory where uh, there's a lot of emphasis on, or there's a lot of work going on, on uh, geological processes, on planetary exploration, space exploration, things like that. So that environment and plus my skills in instrumentation and so on, uh, meant that I was naturally, you know, sort of attracted towards building space payloads. And that's one of the things that I'm currently doing. I mean, even from here, my old project at PRL still continues. So, so a variety of things, including, you know, doing experiments at different, uh, in different laboratories in India. Uh, we are one of the, I think probably the only group who could do experiments on such kind of molecules, molecular fragmentation studies. Uh, using using ion beams, using electrons, using photons from a synchrotron, all, all the, the whole variety of whole gamut of uh, perturbing agents, so to speak. Uh, I think we did we did quite well there, and a uh, lot of it because of some very enthusiastic and very dedicated colleagues and students. Now, parallel with this, I was uh, I was engaged with a non-governmental organization called Eklave, which works in Madhya Pradesh. Uh, about whom I had heard during my PhD years. So I'm sure all of you know of this experiment of a candle placed above a trough of water on which if you invert a beaker, after some time the candle goes off and some water rushes into, this, into the inverted glass. Okay. Now, the, this experiment stands there in school textbooks for, has, has stood there for years. It probably still is there. Maybe it has been removed from some books. And the explanation that is given for this water rushing in is completely incorrect. Now, this bunch of bunch of people at Eklave, and I think there were a couple of students from TIFR who had also gone and met, met them or were working on them, who actually set right this uh, false uh, explanation of the of this experiment. So when I came to know this, I thought, ah, here is here is a bunch of guys who really know what what they want to do and what uh, what needs to be done. So when I had the when I had somewhat uh, time some time to spare. I, I contacted them, started working, I mean, started talking to them, working with them. And they're mostly engaged in, or they were, and they still are, uh, mostly engaged in school curricula, in uh, doing, uh, in improving school teaching by and large, and so on. And, you know, this was a bunch of extremely dedicated, extremely hardworking people. Uh, their persistence is amazing. The depth of their engagement with teachers and uh, students in very remote places, in district, wherever, wherever we go, is astounding. More importantly, they have a very welcoming nature to whoever wants to join, uh, join hands with them. And this made for a very, very, uh, you know, very, very pleasant, very, very fruitful, uh, and uh, I, I'm sure a lifelong association with them. And things that I've learned there uh, have actually rubbed off on me in more than one ways. And I'm really grateful for that engagement. So, you know, this was like about 15 years after my PhD. That's 15 or almost 20 years from my PhD. And at which time, you know, I had uh, I'd spent far too long in one place compared to the nomadic life that I had led in my childhood. It almost seemed like an infinity uh, in PRL and Dada. So that's when I thought, okay, maybe I should, you know, uh, go back to what I really wanted to do, uh, that is teach and do research both together. And ISA seemed like a very nice uh, opportunity. So I moved to the ISA system. I did a short one semester stint at ISA Mohali on a sabbatical leave. And Professor Satyamurthy, who I had collaborated with, was kind enough to invite me for a sabbatical in 2012. I liked the system. Then I applied uh, for a position both to ISA Pune and Mohali. And essentially for family reasons, I came to Pune, but I could have equally well have gone to Mali. Moving to the ISA system was, was quite, a, quite a change. Uh, a whole new things a set of things happening. Uh, a very different experience, uh, also teaching, uh, which I was keen on. This is something I could do. And, uh, you know, all these things, I mean, happened quite unknowingly. I, I don't think I was prepared for all of this. And uh, and these were really unforeseen engagements. Like you know, after having come to uh, ISER Pune, very quickly uh, we started uh, mentoring the formation of ISER Tirupati. I was involved with that. Uh, that was quite an experience. Uh, so you know, this this was not something I could have done had I stayed on in PRL, setting up a new institute, setting up the academic program. 
um, and many other things that are associated with uh, the challenges of uh, setting up a new institute. And of course, in, in due course, I uh, became the dean here. And uh, that again meant uh, tackling uh, a very different set of problems than what one is used to uh, in, a, in an academic career. Uh, now, any work of this kind, and the kind of uh, academic administration or any administrative work that one does, uh, has a lot of pressures, a lot of anxieties, a lot of uncertainties, and a lot of dealing with people of different uh, natures, people with different views, people with different expectations. And uh, there is really no single training that prepares you for that set of problems, and certainly not as an academic researcher. I mean, there are, I'm sure there are people who get specifically trained for such things, but uh, this is not something that will happen in, a, in an academic environment. But I guess the you know the wider you reach out, and when I say wider, I just don't mean I don't just mean a wide range of people, but a wide range of topics, a wide range of ideas, a wide range of environments, a wide range of situations. The more you reach out to this through self motivation, of course, and the more you keep your eyes and ears open, uh, the better you come out, and the better you are prepared for to handle new situations. And uh, this helps you in, in pretty much any sphere of life. What is important is that you think and train yourself to analyze situations from differing points of view and not just from your own cozy corner. And you have to learn to live by your decisions, okay? so whatever decision you may take. And it may not always be possible to take your own decisions and what decision you take may not be for the best, but that is where your resilience and your judgment really comes into play. It is this that, that really helps you in life. And in order to be able to see things clearly so that you can judge well for yourself, you know, one of the simplest things to do is to simply change your own point of view. We are so used to thinking about things from our own point of view that we often forget that there could be a different, equally reasonable point of view that is held by someone else. Okay. That's something important to remember. And that's something that has helped me in not just in my academic career, but also in whatever else I have done. It also helps to organize yourself well, I mean, oneself well. If you organize yourself well, I mean, it, leave aside the niceties. I mean, a neatly laid out table looks better than a messy table. So I'm not talking really of the beauty part of it or the, the visual aspect of it. But if you can organize your thoughts well, if you can organize uh, yourself well, uh, it improves the clarity of your thought and it also improves the efficiency of your actions. And this is something, uh, you know, I mean, you only have so much time in this world. So to make the most of it, it is important that you organize yourself well. The other thing I, I would like to say before I end is uh, the higher you place your expectations or the more demanding you are, the greater can be your frustration. I'm not saying they will be, but, they, but the greater the chance that your frustrations will be great. I agree that aiming low is a crime, but aiming too high can also be your downfall. So again, you have to train yourself to judge right and you have to learn from your mistakes. Similarly, a lot of people put a lot of emphasis on setting goals, setting what you want, setting your desires. But I think it is important, at least as much, if not more, to know what you don't want. And it seems that this part about, not, about knowing what you do not want is very difficult for a lot of people. But I think it is very important. And uh, I think I can manage that. Last but not the least, every experience that you have is valuable. You should learn to store away every bit of experience, every bit of information that you can. You keep track of that, learn to sit back, think about everything that has happened, try to connect the dots, make connections, make correlations, and then you will you never know what will come in handy. Someday you will realize, oh, this is something I had learned or seen or heard 20 years ago. Didn't make sense then, but maybe it does now. 
So being able to recall your experiences is important. And you learn this only by training yourself. It doesn't come from outside. Very important is to be non-judgmental. You know, every one of us has a place in this world, whether you're doing well, doing badly, or even with, you know, what you might call people with idiosyncrasies, stupidities, follies, or incompetence. Each one of us has a place. We are all part of a distribution. Sometimes you might be in the right tail of the distributions. In some respect, you might be in the left tail of the distribution. Doesn't make you a superior or a worse person. It is important to remember that almost always, there are some people who are less fortunate than you are, but also that there are some people who are more competent than you imagine yourself to be. It's very important to remember this. With this, I'll stop. Thank you, Professor Bapak. This was amazing. Um, Akash is asking on the uh, you, live stream chat box. Yeah. How does that feel when administrative work takes up time you want to dedicate on research? What keeps the balance going? Is it frustrating? Uh, yes, it is. It is sometimes frustrating, and I think uh, my my PhD students will tell you this uh, more than I can, because uh, you know with with administrative responsibilities taking up time, and uh, very often these responsibilities are. Uh, I mean, these, these jobs become very time-bound, like you need something tomorrow because 10 other things depend on it or five other people are depending on this or whatever. And then it, it can be frustrating. But what is, what is important is to be able to compartmentalize things. So one has to learn to you know, make compartments. Look, I mean, I'm going to spare time for administrative work now. And then once this is done, I'll try my best not to let that intrude upon my time for my research or for my students or for my lab. So that kind of compartmentalization is, is essential. And if you manage to do that well, uh, then it, it's not such a burden. But you are right uh, that administrative responsibilities like these uh, do indeed take away time. And uh, they can be quite, quite demanding and quite uh, frustrating at times because all of us have only 24 hours. Um, okay, Sadmik is asking. When you moved yes, to sir. Germany, uh, when you moved to Germany in postdoc, did you always had plans to coming back to India? If uh, yes, yes, what were yes, your motivations? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, I, I think I had I had very uh, I very clearly had this had a plan of coming back to India, and uh, I had started looking for opportunities pretty early in my uh, in my tenure at at Freiburg. Uh, so the motivation was the following. I mean, it's it's it sound it might sound altruistic, but well, that is what it was. Um, I thought that that it's. I mean, I I had I had the privilege of being educated so well, being made use uh, or having made use of the facilities, the best of the facilities that the uh, country had to uh, give its uh, its students or its citizens, and uh, I thought it was it was time for payback. Plus, I also knew that uh, you know, uh, living in a foreign country may not uh, really suit me very well. I mean, I may not, I may not be as happy as I would uh, when it came to doing things other than just research or just my academics. Okay. So I'm sure that my my academic progress uh, would have uh, been as good or better had I stayed on in Germany or anywhere else. Uh, but uh, I'm not so sure about other aspects and life is not just about being one track, uh, no, not for me at least, and for some people it is, uh, but for me, uh, it certainly wasn't the case. So, you know, that, that's really what motivated me to come back. And I also knew that the longer you stayed abroad, the harder it was to come back. So I pretty much came back at the first opportunity, but not quite the first, maybe the second. But I came back pretty early. And uh, I think staying on for longer uh, would have made it harder to come back. Okay. Uh, Amog Rakesh is asking, yes. so how did you get interested in the particular type, topic that you currently do your research on? Oh. Um, yeah, so... Mm, that's hard. I mean, it's really hard. 
so i think i think it it probably started with uh, a fascination for quantum mechanics and it could i mean it could be that i i sort of realized that the uh, that the most immediate applications of quantum mechanics were to atomic physics or something like that and perhaps perhaps i don't have a clear answer but something something along those lines and then i think what also happened is that uh, I, as i told you i mean i was i was quite fascinated by uh, you know engineering aspects so when i went to tfr tfr had this uh, ion accelerator uh, quite a marvel of technology and uh, all the experiments that were happening there and the physics experiments that were happening there uh, involved uh, very very uh, intricate interesting and sophisticated instrumentation so maybe the you know combination of things like you know doing experiments in atomic physics involved uh, high end technology it also meant that uh, you are directly addressing problems uh, which uh, quantum mechanics purported to have solutions to and things like that all of this put together could have been uh, the contributing causes i don't i don't think i have one answer for that Yeah. Um, Nikita is asking, how has your view of an equation with young students changed over the years from being in Ahmedabad to teaching in Aizer, overlooking oh, okay. the setting up of Tirupati becoming Dean Academics? Oh, uh, yeah. So, um, see, I think until I was I was in in PRL, my interaction with uh, college year students was quite minimal. I mean, we used to run a uh, run a weekends program for college. Uh, students some three or four of us used to run this program for local colleges so i i did interact with uh, students then and uh, then after i came, i mean see that the reason as i said why i shifted from prl is first of all i mean i i was quite loath to the idea of staying in one place forever so that was one reason and then my association with eklave where i looked into the into the intricacies into the details into the depth of uh, teaching or pedagogy and so on uh, that also contributed in some way to thinking of a of a career involving teaching uh, when i came here i i was quite happy to interact with a lot of people and i think the 2014 batch of students was the first batch that i interacted with and to their misfortune uh, perhaps i ended up teaching them four different courses in their five, five years uh and that was that was a very enriching experience uh, it it connected me to the younger generation uh, which i think i was uh, missing while at prl uh, at tirupati where we actually uh, you know really started the institute and looked into every little bit that is required to get an institute going uh, the association was even closer and we had to not just worry about the academic part i mean the interaction was not limited to just the classroom but also to hostels the problems in the hostels and and a whole lot of other things and uh, that is when my association with uh, students of that age group actually grew grew much beyond what it was uh, earlier and i i also realized the importance of uh, many other things like psychology uh like uh, you know thinking about people's social backgrounds thinking about people's uh challenges in adapting to new environments so these were things that i mean i was i was remotely aware of but i never really had a one to one face on experience with these uh, which i uh, i mean which which i first came across after coming here and and i i i'm sure i learned a lot of things there and maybe it has made me more aware and more uh, more, more responsive to such uh, situations and such uh, from these these uh, facets or aspects of youth okay. and my equation with young students uh, i think it's quite quite varied i mean it it you you get along with some you don't get along with some all all these things happen so as as i keep like to keep saying there's always a gaussian distribution of things uh, 
uh, you fit in somewhere. You, you don't fit in most places. Yeah. Agnik is adding as, an, a follow, as a follow up to the administrative duty question. Do you miss teaching theory, advanced theory? Sorry. Yes, yes. Do you miss teaching <laughs> theory courses at advanced levels? Is it, it is long since we hired you for one. Yes, so I might be teaching one next semester. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I do miss that. And uh, actually, I uh, it's true that I'm teaching less after having become the dean uh, because uh, uh, essentially because of time, time pressures. It's not easy to do justice to both. Uh, but yes, uh, next semester, maybe I'll, I'll teach. Uh, if Sai is asking on the YouTube. Uh, live stream. What advice would you give us regarding how to be good researchers? Uh, how to be good researchers? Okay. So, um, okay. So I, um, I'll I'll speak of it from the physics point of view. Okay. I mean, it, it might it might seem like a physics loaded uh, rattle, uh, but see the point is that a lot of things. Uh, are, uh, so if you if you'll pardon the use of the term, they have, so to speak, been done. Okay. What I'm trying to say is that a lot of research has already, already happened. And to be able to carve out something beyond that is actually a steep challenge. And it is important that you are abreast with what has happened so far. Uh, because you uh, you need uh, uh, you need to you need to you know cover a whole lot of material before you know what today's problems are. Uh, so in order to do good research, you first need to know what is already out there in the field. Mm. Or it could also happen that you have an idea. And when you start pursuing that idea, you figure out what else has been done along those lines um, for the, on that problem in the past. Now, if you find that there's not been much work in that, in that, on that problem, you might uh, be, we might strike lucky and you know, do something very, really, very nice. So, but, but as I said, I mean, your ability to define a problem, uh, rests enormously on the quantum of information and the quantum of knowledge you already have. So, you know, keeping abreast of what is happening, keeping abreast of what has already happened is really the first step. Uh, have I, have I uh, remotely answered your question? I don't know. Um, she, she cannot answer because she's- Oh, she, on, she's on YouTube. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Moving on, uh, Riddhi is asking, so in your college life, was it easy for you to stick to the coursework or did you have to balance coursework with other reading material in popular science, philosophy or science fiction? Oh, sure, sure, lacquer, sure. How did you manage? <laughs> yeah, no, no, so so I think I, I, I was reading much more in those days than I do now. Okay. And uh, I used to, I used to read, I think just about as much of other things as I read uh, my textbooks. Uh, so uh, by other things, I mean other things not related to the courses, okay, but related to the coursework. I, I did read a lot. Mm, and how did I manage? Well, I mean, you have 24 hours of which you need seven hours of sleep, five hours of college, uh, three hours of lab once in a while. The rest of the time is for you to choose. I mean, you decide what you want to do. Okay. So so it's, it's really a question of dividing your 24 hours well. Uh, there, there is no, I mean, I don't think there's any other, other prescription. It's, it's really about setting your priorities. So if you like to read about uh, philosophy, or if you write, uh, like to read about popular mechanics, or if you like to read about trains, uh, well, go ahead and do it. Uh, but just make sure that you have your priorities, right? I mean, you, if you are studying for your uh, for second year final exams and you uh, pay no attention to what has been taught in class, uh, you will be in trouble, uh, even if you end up uh, reading everything about the world's railways. So it's it's really a balance that you have to strike. You have to uh, learn to strike this balance on your own. And this is really your own personal decision. Uh, I, I don't think anybody can help you there. 
Um, okay, that may be thing. Another follow up. Uh, Is there anything yeah. in particular you picked up as a professor from your teachers as undergrad in undergrad days? You take a quiz on the very first day of the course. Does this root? Does this have a root in those days? Um, okay, so this quiz on the first day is is not something I picked up from anyone. This is my idea, uh, but yes, I mean some of the things that I that I uh, that I like to do, uh, I think I have picked up. I, I think Professor Patil has been an has been an enormous influence. Uh, so his you know his his logic behind not having too many exams uh, still resonates with me. I mean I I am not a great fan of having too many short uh, uh, short term exams uh, because uh, I, I I very strongly believe that if you have too many of these small piecewise exams, uh, you don't quite see the big picture you don't learn to correlate apparently diverse things uh, you don't learn to see links between things that you studied sometime earlier uh, with what you are studying now and uh, it it sort of only tests rather short term things so that is that is something that is an influence from my uh, from my student days, uh, things that I learned from my professors. Uh, other things I see, I, I mean that is as I said, I mean this is one influence from from Professor Patil that I that I can speak of. The other influences are actually a mixed bag. There have been many. I mean, I, I, it's it's hard to say uh, talk of one or the other. Uh, there have been many. And uh, these are from a whole bunch of uh, different people in different settings. And what I've what I've learned is that uh, even for a, even for a uh, a short lecture or for a for what is considered an informal talk on a larger stage, uh, you have to prepare. I mean, even today's talk or whatever talk or chat or whatever you like. I did prepare. I mean, I did, this is not all impromptu. I mean, I'm not. I'm not talking uh, as I look at the at, at, at the words or uh, at the written material. But I had to spend some time thinking about what I want to say, and this is true of anything that you that you lecture on. Okay. And and uh, it it is it is also true that uh, you, in order to be able to convey your ideas well. Uh, or teach well, it is really important to be able to go way beyond what you, I mean, be prepared way beyond what you expect to discuss in a class. Uh, and this is something that I have learned uh, over the years. I mean, it's it's a far cry from, you know, the talk that I might have given in my college days. Uh, but you really, it, there's a lot of background work that, background preparation that you need to do even for small ones. So I'm reminded of one very, uh, of, a, of an anecdote. And I think this is, this is attributed to Mark Twain. So Mark Twain was, or maybe O. Henry, uh, a friend of his calls up, who is a newspaper man. He says, you know, I have a small column to fill. Can you quickly write a story? He said, well, had you had you asked me to write a page full, I could have done it. But a short story takes a very long time to prepare. Okay, Um. the last question, if anyone else has anything else to say, feel free to turn on your mic and say it. Um, okay, the last question I'd like to ask. So how do you balance personal and professional life currently? And did you face any major dilemmas or conflicts? Mm. Yes. Uh, see that, as I, as I said even earlier, I mean, uh, somebody had asked a question about how uh, how I balanced, uh, you know, classroom um, textbooks or whatever, course material and non extracurricular reading and so on, and what was the work life balance uh, then? I mean, in my college days. So the same set of questions actually persist uh, for everyone at every stage in life. So today it's a different set of questions. It's, uh, it's the, the questions today would be about how how much time I can devote to my home, to my daughter, to my wife, yeah. uh, versus how much time I can devote to uh, my institution. So 
so it's again a, a, a question of setting your priorities now if if you and these priorities cannot uh, are not are not rigid i mean today i might think that you know for the next one week there is something very important something you know, very important happening in the institute and uh, as a dean i need to be uh, available all the time and uh, so so my priority at that phase has to be my full attention to my responsibilities as a dean but this cannot be true for all 52 weeks of the day at some point i'll have to say look i mean i need to give time to my family i need to give time to my daughter who is whatever sick or who is who needs my help in something or whatever else or you know some friend is uh, unwell or whatever so these priorities uh, do keep shifting it is a question of how you how you keep how you juggle between them it it, it is a jugglery but then in the end you realize that you sometimes uh, set wrong priorities and uh, then something goes for a toss but if you learn to correct your correct i mean correct your course based on your mistakes uh, it is not so hard so if if i if i realize that i'm i'm paying too much attention to uh, my responsibilities as, as an administrator and too little to my research uh, my students will be unhappy and rightly so and maybe at some point they will point this out to me that look i mean they i'm not giving them enough attention so so it is it is really uh, a question of uh, you know looking back at what you're doing and judging for yourself whether your balance has been right uh, so so there's no there's no single set formula the boundary line the boundary conditions are that there are 24 hours to a day 365 days to a week uh, sorry to a year and uh, you know life is what it is you have to make uh, the most of it and being organized helps uh, you have to learn to compartmentalize things I and mean, when you are doing things uh, that are important for your research uh, try not to mix in your head things that would be relevant only to your administrative responsibilities or your responsibilities at home vice versa when you are at home and you know spending some family time together uh, don't let your responsibilities at work uh, cloud uh, that time that kind of compartmentalization that kind of uh, demarcation or uh, usually helps okay the absolute last question um that do fastik is asking uh oh, yeah, doing... i see it here hmm. yeah all right um uh, I, i'll send it down for you sure sure on the youtube link uh does doing a uh, research in india pack as much scientific reputation if the same were done abroad like how much difference would it make if someone were to do a phd in india and in germany and then apply for a faculty position in isa okay uh so okay there there are several several i mean it's, it's a slightly loaded question there are there are many aspects to this so if you look at uh, the composition of uh, faculty members in in isa today you will find that there is a good number of people who did their phd in india and have continued to work in india uh and uh, there is uh, and there's a larger number of people who have done their phd abroad and then have come to india uh but uh, i don't think that this is necessarily a reflection of uh, or this is not necessarily to say that if you did your phd abroad it would be much better off uh in every place i mean whether it is iser pune or it is iser mohali or it is iisc bangalore or tif at every level be it the entry level at uh, bsms or the passing out level at phd or whatever or ms uh there will be only a fraction of people who have the uh, ability who have the skills uh to make it to a certain level in academics so it would not be right to assume that you know if you trace back the lineage of people who are faculty members here and you find that they come from a particular university uh, the hit rate for that university is extremely high okay you will generally not find these things except barring a few exceptions of very very top universities so it is it is not a it is not i mean it is hard to answer this question by simply saying a phd in india versus phd abroad it depends on what kind of work you have done 
it depends on where you have done the work. Uh, yeah, I mean, where you have done the work does depend. I, I do admit that it does depend. Uh, I mean, it does matter. But there's no there's no single answer just based on the country that you do your work in. Uh, very good work has been done in some places in India, and very ordinary work has been done in many places abroad. When you apply for a faculty position in ISR, as I said, there are, there are many people, I included, uh, who did not uh, do their PhD abroad. Okay. So there's your, there's your answer. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for doing this. This was a wonderful session. Okay. Thank you, everybody Welcome. else, for coming here. Thanks to all of you for listening in. I don't know how many of you are listening in, but thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. 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 Thank you so much. Bye.